first guest speaker of the session is Miguel Miguel. He will tell us about star formation rate estimates at 2.51 with the BEMOS public extragalactic radius survey. By so welcome, Miguel. Yeah, I okay. Yes, do you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. So do you see it in full screen? Yes. Okay. So thanks for the opportunity to, for me to speak about my work. So I'm Miguel Figuera, a postdoc fellow at the National Center for Nuclear Research. And today we'll speak about star formation rate estimation at intermediate redshift, so between 0.5 and 1, using VIPERS. And this work has been done by me and my collaborators, Katajna Mawek, Agnes Capolo, and the VIPERS team. So to study formation and evolution of galaxies, we need to know some characteristics of each of the galaxies. And one of them is related to the buildup of stellar mass, and this buildup of stellar mass is characterized by the star formation rate, so the amount of star which is created per amount of time, so in solar masses per year, in general. And thanks to the SFR, we can study the evolution and formation of galaxies over cosmic time, so a different redshift and different epoch of the universe, to study, for instance, the star formation rate density. And it is very useful, therefore, to study this at different redshift to have several SFR indicators. So, for instance, we have the ultraviolet photons, ultraviolet bands, which trace directly high mass stars, but suffer from high attenuation. We have the H alpha line, which trace H2 regions, uh, which are created by high mass stars. But this is a spectral line, so we need a spectroscopic survey, which is not always available. And we have infrared tracer, which trace the dust heated by massive stars. But this is not always available. For instance, we don't have, for every galaxy's airshell measurement or speed zone measurement. And the resolution of Ys above a certain redshift is not enough to compute the star formation rate properly. And moreover, we need consistent star formation indicators and calibration over a wide range of redshift. So to do this, <coughs> we use uh, the VIMOS Public Extragalactic Redshift Survey, so VIPERS. And VIPERS is a spectroscopic survey of around 90,000 galaxies between a redshift of 0.5 and 1.5. And this survey is based on CFHT-LS. So on the bottom image on the left, we can see one of the two fields, so W1, uh, in which you have all the galaxies measured uh, in VIPERS, so between 0.5 and 1.5 in redshift. And since this survey is based on CFHTLS, we have the UGRIZ bands. So we have roughly the optical part of the spectrum of each galaxy. The VIPERS catalog was cross-correlated with GALAX, so we have also the UV part of the spectrum. It was co cross-correlated with WISE and SPITZER, so we also have the IR part of the spectrum. And in our work, we also cross-correlated VIPERS with airshell data, and so we have far infrared parts of the spectrum. And since this is a spectroscopic survey, we have detection of uh, some lines. Uh, um, so four lines, so H beta, O2, and two O3 lines. And on the right plot, you can see one example of a galaxy at redshift point 56, with all these lines uh, detected. So the first thing we do in VIPERS uh, to begin our work is to select a sample of star forming galaxies. So for this, we use the blue BPT diagram from uh, La Marie et al. La Marie 2011. And the blue PT diagram uh, relates the ratio of O3 to H beta versus O2 to H beta. And so on this plot, you can see all the galaxies which are um, categorized uh, in function of these two ratio and are categorized uh, as Cepher 2 or star forming Cepher or liners or star forming galaxies. Um, on the table on the right, you have all the galaxies in the sample initially, and you have the number of galaxies in each of these categories. And the sample used uh, in our work is a sample of star forming galaxies plus the sample of star forming Cepher galaxies. 
uh, for a total of 2,538 galaxies. And we checked after that the calibration of SFR we did for star-forming galaxies on one part and on the other part star-forming plus star-forming CFR2 galaxies is not different. So we can use these two samples, so these two star-forming and star-forming CFR2, to increase the statistical significance of our sample, of our work, uh, without having a different calibration. And so to compare uh, intermediate redshift uh, galaxies with low redshift galaxies, we use uh, GSWLC, which is a catalog based on SDSS, so at a redshift less than 0.3, uh, which was created by uh, Salim et al. Uh, 2016. And in this catalog, we have initially 640,000 galaxies, and we have also other properties in this catalog, such as uh, the quality of the set, uh, if there is galaxy data for these galaxies or wise data. So we did a selection uh, based on the catalog. And so we have less galaxies. So at the end, we had uh, 160,000 gala 60, galaxies. After that, we cross correlated this catalog with the MPAGHU catalog, which is for line measurements, to obtain line measurements. So we have less uh, galaxies. And we also select a sample of star forming galaxies using a BPT diagram, so a kind of different BPT diagram, because now it relates the ratio of O3 to H beta versus N2 to H alpha. So we don't need the O2 line in that case. And thanks to this BPT diagram, we have a sample of star forming galaxies. We did a mass cut to have the same mass range and, as in Vipers. And finally, we, we have the final photometric sample with around 100,000 galaxies and a spectroscopic sample with 40,000 galaxies. So the difference between the photometric sample and spectroscopic sample is that in the spectroscopic sample, we also have a signal to noise selection on O2 and O3 line to compute, to estimate the metallicity. And so due to this um, constraint, we have less galaxies having good O2 lines and O3 lines. <clears throat> so now on SFR estimation, so in the local universe, uh, H-alpha is will, will be used to compute the star formation rate and to calibrate other tracers because it's one of the best uh, calibrators. Uh, it traced i mass star through H2 regions uh, and it doesn't suffer so much attenuation compared to UV band, for instance. But above a redshift of 0.5, the H alpha line is shifted out the optical window. So we need another way to compute the star formation rate for our galaxy without H alpha. And for this, we use SIGAL, so the code investigating galaxy emission, to reconstruct the spectral energy distribution using the panchromatic data we have for Vipers uh, from galaxy far ultraviolet to Herschel. Mm, so this was done, we did it for Vipers. Uh, for GSWLC, it was done in Salimental 2016, and it was also done with um, SIGAL, which is the reason why we choose this catalog for consistency, because the SFR was derived uh, in kind of the same way, with the same software. And so for all of these galaxies, we have now an SFR estimation using SIGAL, which we will consider as the, the true SFR estimation to calibrate uh, our bands. So in this uh, slide, we, you have four plots. Uh, so using, mm, so this is a comparison of the SFR computed with one band. So FUV, NUV, U-band, and Spitzer 24 micrometers versus the SFR obtained with SIGAL. So with a multi wavelength data for each of the galaxy. In blue, you have Viper's data. Uh, in density plot and red, you have DSWLC data. So SDSS galaxy at low redshift. And the first thing we can see is that a few new view band and spikes of 24 micrometers, so rest frame bands, are a good tracer of SFR. The second thing is that it's, uh, they are a good tracer of SFR, both for SDSS and for Vipers, so it works from a shift zero to a shift of around one. And the third thing, so, and also it works very well despite the difference in the running uh, in the run of SIGAL. So we don't have, for instance, the same attenuation though, but it doesn't really affect the SFR estimation. And also the low used 
to compute the star formation using one band are all calibrated on nearby galaxies and SDSS galaxies, but it also works on galaxies at higher redshift. And we see on this plot that the U band has, um, has a smaller scatter, smaller scatter, uh, followed by Spitzer and Youth. So it seems that the U band represents better the SFR of the galaxies compared to the other bands, more precise. Uh, so we did this calibration also for H beta O2, O3, so all the lines we detected in Vipers. Uh, so you have those three plots, so H beta O2, O3 versus the SFR derived with Seagal. Uh, all these SFR were derived using the Kanika theta relation. For H beta, it was, uh, we use the H alpha relation with SFR. And since we don't have H alpha in, in Vipers, we assume uh, the case B recombination, so the theoretical value of 2.86, to estimate H alpha from H beta. And we see on the plot that it works quite well, even without H alpha, the H alpha line. Uh, for for O2, we also see that using Kanika tradition without metallicity dependence, um, um, so metallicity dependence on O2, and it works also uh, quite well, also for SDSs, and also for O3. Uh, O3 has the biggest scatter, so it's uh, in our work the worst uh, the worst tracer of SFR. So we try to correct for metallicity uh, for O2 and O3, uh, but it doesn't change significantly the SFR. So we can use uh, SFR law, which is, doesn't depend on metallicity. Mm. And the last thing in that uh, slide is that the O3 to H alpha ratio for Vipers and the O3 to H alpha ratio for GSWHC um, is different, which means that for contrary to H beta and O2, where we use the same calibration to obtain the SFR, we have to change uh, the calibration for O3 at low redshift and O3 at higher redshift. So O3 in our sample needed to be calibrated using our sample, and we calibrated it using H beta. But it's not very practical because if we have already H beta, we have already a better SFR estimation than O3. And this is so very preliminary results on SFR estimation between Seagal and lines versus redshift. Uh, so this is the ratio of Seagal H beta or Seagal O2, so left and right in function of the redshift. And we see that between SDSS <coughs> and Vipers, so low redshift galaxies and high redshift galaxies, or intermediate redshift galaxies, there is a decrease of this ratio. So we have an overestimation of uh, the SFR using lines compared to SIGAN. So this is preliminary result, so we need to work on it to see if this, de if this uh, dependence is true or is due to uh, some parameters we used uh, in SIGAN, for instance. So that's all, so that's my conclusion. So we compare um, SFR star forming galaxies uh, between zero and one. We reconstruct the galaxy spectral energy distribution. So we have a catalog of SFR, but we also have stellar mass, attenuation, and more of the parameters. Uh, we have a tighter correlation between uh, U band and R24 rest frame uh, bands with SFR. And we see that using uh, the calibration done in SDSS, so using low redshift galaxy, works very well to predict the SFR at higher redshift, so around 0.7 to 2.1. And we also calibrated the spectral line at a redshift of 0.7, so that's the median of Vipers. Uh, we saw that the chemical relation for HB10 O2 also works well, with a scatter lesser than 0.2 dex. The metallicity does not affect the SFR estimation, so we don't need, uh, so in Vipers, so the correction of metallicity in Vipers does not significantly affect the SFR. Uh, so O3 in our case is not the best tracer, but it's not a big surprise. Uh, and it needs to be calibrated uh, in Vipers, and we cannot use the calibration done in SDSS to estimate the SFR uh, in, in Vipers. And so we also, 
uh, observe a decrease of the ratio of staphomine rate of seagull uh, to star formation rate of the line with the red sheet. But this is preliminary reason, and we need to work on it to understand why there is this dependence and if this dependence is real. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Miguel. Questions, comments? Anyone? Anyone? Uh, Nicola, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting result. Nicola, please ask your question. Do you hear me okay? A uh, little bit of voice, but yes. Uh, okay. Uh, the last result you presented, the, the dependence of the star formation rate of cigar over a line seems mm -hmm. to be a function, decreasing a function of relationship. Do you have any preliminary hypothesis or proposal which could result in this interesting relation? Uh, so for now, we don't have because that's very preliminary and we Maybe we need also to check uh, if the parameters we put in Seagal can affect this relation, for instance. That would be the first, I think, the first thing to do, to see this if this relation uh, still holds when we change, it's, if it's not dependent on the parameters we used in Seagal. But that's for well, future works, but in that paper that will be discussed. Thank you. Is there an uh, perhaps limit to the spectroscopic observation here. A tiny, maybe very high star structure are only detected in spectroscopy spec samples. Would that be possible? Uh, sorry, I didn't hear. Quite well. Yeah, there are perhaps limit here for spectroscopy. Because at high rate, it's only very high star structure that are detected in emission line. Would that be possible? Yeah, I, I don't hear very well. Sorry. Yes, I, I agree with Tomo. It's what I was going to say. I believe oh. that this is a selection effect, unfortunately. It's not real. What happened is at, you start at high redshift to have very serious difficulty to include a galaxy. You can only include the galaxy if you got a high enough signal to noise with H beta. And that's really right at the margin. So you systematically left out many galaxies which had weaker H beta. They were not included in your high redshift sample. And so, of course, the ones that managed to get into the sample are unusually strong in H beta. The only way to really fix that, of course, aside from to get much better data, would be you could take all of the galaxies that you left out and maybe do a statistical stacking analysis where you could detect the H beta statistically. And that, I think, might give exactly the same star formation rate as Seagal gives. So um, we, we can see. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that you're not going to try to use oxygen-3 for star formation rate. I don't, I don't think it's, it's worth it. Uh, when you use H beta, I assume that you are making some kind of correction for the stellar absorption, which is underneath the H beta emission, that's that's can be important, yes? Yeah. Yes, so for as they say, for instance, we apply the, um, the correction done in Kinet Sal 2003, I, I guess, it's this paper. Okay. Using equivalent widths. Thank you. Dennis, do you, do you have a question? Could you be quick? Yeah, well, it's about the same thing that um, uh, Mark just asked. I mean, I, I was wondering if you estimate, uh, Miguel, that uh, metallistic corrections were good or what? Well, that's just something that you apply, but you were not able to trust them. Because I'm surprised that the corrections do not change uh, what you get, do, do not improve your correlations. Uh, which, uh, which modification? You... Oh, the metallicity corrections. Ah, okay, so here. Yeah, so do you think uh, the metallicity estimates are okay or uh, do you have doubts on their validity? Uh, 
Uh, well, I use the correction to the F3 method. We're using the calibration of Z uh, Zarinsky uh, et al. Uh, 94. So I know it works quite well, at least at a redshift. So that's why uh, I am confident in it. Uh, so when I say it does not significantly change, so when using the metallicities, the scatter decreases, but it's so insignificant that it may be not a very, uh, we don't need to, to put a lot of effort if it's just to reduce the scatter by point uh, 0 0.01, I guess. Uh, but maybe I could try also another estimate of the metal city. Uh, for instance, I think uh, O3 to H beta can be a tracer of metal city. Okay, thank you. Okay, so time's up. Uh, so thank you, Miguel.